Here we are yet again on another exciting lecture here in our introduction to TV production class. I'm the host, your TV guru, Dave Harris. Today we're going to talk about analog and digital television. We're going to discuss some of the basics of television, talk a little bit about what changes have occurred over the last 10 or so years, and give you just a little bit of information to help you be a more knowledgeable television person. I first want to talk about interlaced versus progressive scanning. With interlaced versus progressive scanning, we're going to have different ways that the TV picture can be given to you as a television viewer. If you're looking at this particular video on a computer screen, which I'm assuming most of you are, but probably some of you are looking on a digital device, like a handheld device, that's possible just so you know as well. You can take it with you, watch me when you're out on a date. You know, you're saying, hey, I tell you what, I'm, uh, I'm on a date, but let me show you my TV production professor. He's pretty cool. You can show him on the device, right? Okay, maybe you won't do that. But uh, if you're watching on a computer screen, you're probably looking progressive scanned. With progressive scanned, each line of the video screen is being drawn, starting from the top and then working its way all the way down to the bottom. And then when it gets to the bottom, it returns to the top and draws a new set of lines to provide for you a picture. So if we look at this particular frame of video that you're looking at from about here to about here, something like that, where the scanner is going to start from the top, it's going to work its way down, moving each line individually. When it gets to the bottom, it'll return to the top, start drawing a new one. It'll do that roughly 30, 30 times per second, something like that. It'll draw a new set of lines. That is progressive scanning, when each line is being drawn one after the other. We can contrast that with interlaced scanning. With interlaced scanning, the scanner will still start at the top of the picture, it'll draw that first line, then what it'll do is it'll skip line number two and draw line number three, then line five, seven, nine, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19, 21, and so forth, until it reaches the last odd line at the bottom of the picture. Then it will come up to the top again, start drawing line number two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, and so forth till it gets down to the last even line at the bottom. Then it will return back up to the top and start drawing the odd lines again. Then the even, then the odd, then the even, then the odd. Because it's drawing only half the picture at a time, it needs to do it twice as often. And so you'll find it drawing half the picture 60 times per second. First time it'll be the even lines or the odd lines and then vice versa all the way through. So you're only getting half the picture. This is what we would have seen in television for about, oh what, 50 or 60 years, up until roughly 10 or so years ago when we started to see more conversions to digital, which we'll talk about in just a second. So that's interlaced and digital scanning. There's a couple of other things. Let me grab my cheat sheet here. Oh yes, color, RGB color, RGB. If you've ever heard the, the old song that's sung by young children, the primary colors are one, two, three, red, green, and blue. And those of you who are familiar with that song are like, wait a second, I thought the primary colors, if I remember right from kindergarten, were red, yellow, and blue. What is the with, what's with this red, green, and blue, Dave? Come on, you don't know anything. I'll tell you what, what you've learned your entire lives in school is the primary colors of paint or printing, red, yellow, and blue. The primary colors of television are red, green, and blue. If you can imagine the sun or any other light source that's in your house or the headlights on your car, something like that, each of those light sources is made up of three different colors, red, green, and blue. White light is red, green, and blue light in equal proportion. Black light is the absence of red, green, and blue light. So what you're seeing as we look at the various areas of my face, look at this profile, it's beautiful. We can see this skin tone, a little bit of darkness where my hair should be. 
a uh, lot of darkness where I've got too much hair growing on my face, and a little bit of uh, blue hue here in my shirt, uh, a little bit of green back here, and so forth. Each of these are varying levels of red, green, and blue light that are being reflected into the camera lens and onto the camera's pickup device. So the three colors of television are red, green, and blue. The primary colors are one, two, three, red, green, and blue. So if you ever want to teach that song to your children, you can teach them the wrong way, the quote-unquote wrong way to uh, teach them, which would be that it's based on light. Now, when I say it's incorrect, it's totally correct. It's based on light, though. Red, green, and blue, when it's the reflected light, meaning coming off of paint or off of paint pictures or, or printing or something like that, then the primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. So we're going to think of it here in our television production class as red, green, and blue. Let me grab the notes, and very well. We need to move on to resolution. There are many different types of resolution in the video and television world. The first one is what's called vertical resolution. Vertical resolution refers to the number of lines that are being shown to you. If you can imagine, the more lines that are shown to you, this, the tighter they're packed into those little spaces, the more detailed the picture is going to be. The more lines, the more detailed. In this particular video that you're looking at, it was recorded using either 640 vertical lines, or horizontal lines, I should say. I might have said vertical, I meant horizontal lines. We're measuring them vertically, or counting them vertically, but it's horizontal lines either 640 horizontal lines or 720 horizontal lines. Which is it? 720. Engineer tells me that this is 720 lines. So it's being recorded with 720 lines of resolution. If there are more lines of resolution, you're going to get more detail. And just to give you just a little hint of things to come, if you get into high definition, you're going to get roughly maybe 1,080 lines of vertical resolution, meaning there's 1,080 horizontal lines that make up that video or television picture. Then we're getting into that high definition. So we have vertical resolution, which is the number of horizontal lines. The next kind of resolution that I want to talk to you about is spatial resolution. Spatial resolution is the number of horizontal lines, or the vertical resolution, multiplied by the number of pixels per line, which you could kind of think of as being the number of vertical lines. So as JR, our engineer here at the Community Education Channel told me, it's 720 by 480. 720 horizontal lines by 480 vertical lines. Multiply those two together, you end up with the spatial resolution. I don't know what that is, and I will tell you that in the television and video industry, the spatial resolution is not really used as often. One that is used often, though, is the temporal resolution. The temporal resolution is the number of different pictures being shown to you every second. I noted to you earlier that there were 30 pictures being shown to you in a second if it's, if it's uh, progressive scanned and 60 half pictures shown to you, or odd or even pictures shown to you, if it's interlace scanned. Well, with temporal resolution, you've got the 30 or the 60. There are other temporal resolutions, or frame rates, if you will. There's 24, there's 29.97, there's 30, there's 60. There's a number of different frame rates that are common in the television world. And you'll hear most often 30, uh, even if it's 29.97, a lot of times it's rounded to 30. Uh, you'll also hear 24, which is a common frame rate in film. So you have that temporal resolution, the number of pictures that are shown to you at a specific time, usually in a second. The last one I want to talk to you about is the aspect ratio. The aspect ratio is the dimensions of the frame. So if we start here at this corner, we go to this corner. If we were to measure from here over to here, and if we were to measure then from here down to here, and we were to come up with a ratio of those two elements of screen size, we would come up with the aspect ratio. 
This particular video that I'm recording right now, from here to here, if you were to measure it, would be a four by three aspect ratio, meaning that for every four inches, there's going to be three inches. If you were to measure from here to here, you would get some number. If you were to multiply that by three, you would get the number that's measured here. Four by three on this particular video. If you're watching television on a high definition television screen, like you're watching like my favorite show, Elementary, or my other favorite show, The Office, you're going to see a wider screen. We can't even see my arms, right? Because it's not wide enough. But if we were on a different aspect ratio, we would see the width of the screen being increased. With that particular aspect ratio, you're seeing 16 by nine, meaning that for 16 width units, you're getting nine height units. 16 by nine means that it's a wider screen. Those are the two aspect ratios that you're seeing in, t in the television world in today's world. Four by three, which is the one I'm recording, showing to you right now, and 16 by nine, which is one that's more high definition. All right, so that tells us some different ways of measuring video. Now I wanna talk to you about two specific types of video on the fundamental way that video is being shown to you. The first one is called analog. We talked about this during the last lecture, just a little bit about what analog is all about. And I told you that analog had continuously changing levels. Well, you can imagine, I've got lighting coming on me in this studio. I've got one light coming in here, making this nice little shine right here, and I've got lots of lights coming in from the front. They're hitting my face, they're reflecting off my face, and they're going into that lens, going through the different elements of the lens, hitting the pickup device on the camera, and the camera is converting the light into electronic signals. It's essentially converting it into electricity. Depending on how this conversion is done, it will either be analog or, alternatively, as you'll recall from the last lecture, digital. If it's analog, then the brighter the picture is in some area, the higher the electronic signal that's used to represent that brightness. So we see a little bit of white right here, and we see black even on my collar right here, or a little bit over back here on this television screen. This white in an analog system would be represented with more electricity. The black back here would be represented with less electricity. And they would be completely proportional, meaning that the elements of gray or other areas that are somewhere between black and white are going to be some voltage level, some amount of electricity that's in between the highest level, which would be representing white, and the lowest level that's representing black. It would be somewhere in between. And as I move around the frame, even catch JR off guard and move things back and forth, you're going to see that as those things change, the electronic signals that the camera is using to represent those are also going to continuously change. The reason it's called analog is because you essentially have an analogy. What used to be considered light is becoming an analogy in terms of electricity. It's kind of like saying, okay, we've got one thing, we're gonna make it into an analogy of some other thing. So what was light, now we're going to just kind of make it into electricity. We won't get very detailed on how that conversion takes place, but allow me to tell you in this component, this basic area of the class, that it's represented with continuously changing levels and they're represented proportionally. If it's brighter, there's more electricity. If it's darker, there's less electricity. That's analog. Generally, analog television, at least for the first 60 or so years of television's existence, where television was analog, these voltage levels were represented this way. The other thing is, is that for that long time, television was interlaced. They only showed you half the picture at a time, the odd, the even, the odd, the even. The reason they did this was to save money, but it was very poor quality. It was interlaced, it was analog, it was four by three, there wasn't much information being shown to you. The, the, space, the temporal resolution was 29.97 frames per second. There was 29.97 uh, pictures being shown to you every second. And that 29.97, as you can imagine, was very difficult to deal with. So you had analog television that had these continuously changing voltage levels or elements of electricity. You had uh, interlaced, you had four by three, you had half the picture being shown at a time. It was very, very difficult to work with. 
In about the 80s and 90s, the late 1980s and the, throughout the 1990s, people started to ask themselves, why are we showing television in such poor quality? Why are we showing interlaced? Why are we showing, why aren't we showing wider screens like they do in the movies? Why are we showing things looking so bad? Four by three aspect ratio. Why are we showing uh, poor spatial resolution and so forth? And we started to see then high definition television systems. High definition television systems use digital signals to convey that information. Let me give you just a little bit of information about digital signals and how they're of higher quality compared to analog signals. Digital signals, rather than conveying things proportionally, where there's more light, there's more electricity, they're converted into basically an electronic code. And the electronic code is going to be where the signal is either there or it's not. It's going to be high electricity or no electricity at all. High, low, high, low, high, low. Uh, rep represented via zeros and ones. If you really want to get technical, we could talk about it. Those of you who are really into technical stuff, we can talk about what those digital things are all about. And I'll tell you what, in another class, you'll probably learn more about that anyway. But what we do is we say, okay, if there's some specific brightness level, like say the white right here, or the black on my collar, or my skin color, or my shirt color, something like that, it's going to be translated into this specific code that says, okay, this green and, or blue or whatever this color is, black and his skin color and his color of his hair on his face that looks kind of weird, I know, but it's cool, it, it's me. We're going to represent that with a stream of either voltage being there or not there, there, not there, and it'll switch back and forth really, really fast in every second. What this allows is a cleaner looking picture, greater detail, uh, more error control, meaning that if what we saw was some specific color when it was recorded, when we broadcast that to any television on Earth, it's going to be represented in that same way. That's what digital allows us to do. Digital is very cool. It also takes up less space in the world, less space in the broadcast area. So we can put a lot more information in the same amount of space where it used to be that we'd have to broadcast analog signals and they took up a lot of space and we couldn't put much information in there because they took up so much space. With digital signals, we can fit a whole bunch more into that same space. And then what you see is high definition television. If you'll recall 10 or so years ago, high definition really took off. The government in the United States said, we're going to turn off analog television we're going to ensure that all signals are digital. We're going to make sure that it takes up less space so we can put more out there and make better use of the bandwidth that is available to us. So we have analog, the old way of producing television. We have digital, which is the new way of producing television. And digital is, a, is of higher and superior quality compared to analog. Now, just so you know, just so you have an awareness, I'm using analog cameras in here, but a lot of the devices that are used in the CEC control room are digital devices. So the analog signal that's being produced by the camera needs to be converted to a digital signal so that it can be used in the other devices in the control room and then also recorded in a digital format. That requires us to do analog to digital conversion. I will tell you, this isn't such a hard thing. If you can imagine, our world is analog. When you wake up in the morning, the sun, man, I'm, I'm wanting to sing, wake up in the morning feeling like P. Diddy, I don't know, that song, I don't know, that's old school song. I shouldn't even tell you that I know that song. But yeah, you wake up in the morning, you go, you see the sunrise, the sun comes up, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter, and then it goes away. The eyes convert that electronic or lighting signal into nerve electronics. It takes that lighting, it comes into our eye, it converts it into a comparative electronic signal, electro electrical signal that goes to our brain. The world is analog. And so anytime we're using things like digital cameras, there's going to be this analog to digital conversion. It's required because our world is an analog world. So if you see a digital camera, then it's taking analog things like light and sound and it's converting them into digital elements. These streams of voltage being there, voltage not being there. Zeros and ones, or on and off, however you want to call it. We can get more into it as we get into more advanced classes. 
All right. Woo. We're getting close. I want to talk to you about the three common types of television in terms of resolution, number of lines, uh, interlaced and progressive, and so forth. For the longest time, standard definition television had 480 lines of resolution, and it had that frame rate of 29.97, and it was interlaced. So what you would see represented in the television world would be 480i, 480i, meaning 480 lines of resolution, interlaced scanning. The, there are two high definition formats that you're going to see a lot in the world. Uh, one of them is 720p, meaning there's 720 lines of resolution, and it's progressive scanned. That's one common form of high definition television. The last one that I'll tell you about is another type of high definition television, which is 1080i. With 1080i, you have 1080 lines of resolution, but they're interlaced, meaning they're still showing you only half the picture at a time. There's a bit of a war with which is better, 720p or 1080i, and at the present time, they're still relatively equal. I, I believe, and JR may confirm this, it seems like 720p is kind of getting a little bit more uh, common in today's world. He's giving me the thumbs up. 720p is much more common in today's world. Uh, but you'll still see 1080i, and you will also, because it takes a long time to convert the American public, you do still see some 480i as well, people still looking at standard definition television. So those are the three kinds that you'll find. Now, in the video world, we have many more than that. Uh, those are the three most common, but there are, are also different frame rates. And you'll see, so you'll, you'll see numbers like 720p24, 720p24, meaning there's 720 lines, it's progressive scanned, but there's 24 frames per second. That's that temporal resolution. 24 frames per second as opposed to 30. 24 frames per second is common in the film world. So when you see television trying to look like film, you'll see 24 frames per second. And if it needs to be shown on something that's showing 30 frames per second, it needs to be converted. But you'll see something like 720p24, 720p30, 480i29.97, 1080i30. That's giving you the resolution, the type of scanning, progressive or interlaced, and then the temporal resolution or the frame rate. I tell you what, that is the end of this lecture. Nothing to it. It's a short one. Two short ones in a row. How does that happen? Well, I know they're kind of technical. There's a lot going on. I know you may not completely understand what's going on. And of course, as I will tell you at the end of every single one of our lectures, I want you to ask me questions. Type those in, send me a message in Canvas, and so forth. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate you being here. I hope that if you have questions, you let me know that if you see me in the hall, you smile, and as we meet in class, that you're fully ready and prepared, having watched the videos and approaching me with any questions that you have. I will see you either in class or on the next lecture.